ladies and gents, always a pleasure to be here. I'm not going to take too much time greeting you. I'm just going to jump straight in. So we have the notes that you guys have that I put together is how to approach the paper two poetry section. As Ms. Ratcliffe said, that is the section that they analyzed. They could see you needed additional support on. So that's why we are here today. The first thing, and I put it in bold um, on that note, you must actually know the poems. For some of you, you're sitting there, you're going, duh, <laughs> that sounds reasonable. Other people might be thinking, well, you know what? I did the poem in class. Um, I understood it in class. I'm going to focus on my Shakespeare or on my novel because the poem is going to be in front of me when I'm writing my exam. The problem with that is, yes, the poem is in front of you, but do you remember the context of the poem, the central message of the poem, the structure of the poem? Do you have a general idea of the diction and imagery used in the poem? If you don't know those things, off pat, going into the exam without even seeing that in front of you, then you don't know the poem well enough. So that should be your test. When you are studying, what I want you guys to do is to look at a list of the poems, okay? and go, what do I know about each of those poems? Now, by this point, we should have done up until number nine, the morning sun is shining. So I'm going to come back to this list because I want to use it as a very, very quick revision um, before we dive into our subject, our specific poems. Before I do that, though, my teenage son is upstairs making a noise. So I'm going to very quickly mute my mic. Sorry, while I yell at him to stop making a noise, uh, teachers can't concentrate when there's too much noise going on. So please give me 30 seconds. Okay, he promises he's going to stop singing in the shower now, so hopefully I can continue to teach. Um, let's go back to where I was. Let me find my place. Okay, so we're going to look at just those titles as a little way in um, as we look at these things. Okay, so the first thing that you need to know is you need to have a basic idea. Okay, what's the poem about? That's fine. But then you also must know what's the context about. And you all should have pens. And this is something that I'd like you to write at this point. You're going to write in here a definition for the context of the poem. And then we're going to write a definition for the central message of the poem. And then we're going back to that image that I've got, where I've got the list of those poems. And we're very quickly going to work through what's the context, what's the message, what's the context, what's the message. I don't want you to write anything down when we do that, because that is very quick. That's just a test. Do you know the four poems that five poems that we cover with this revision session, we will get into the context and the message in those poems, in the questions that we do. So those are the ones that we're going to focus on. The others, if you don't know them, you're going to go and make your own notes about them. You're going to go back to your poem and look at the title and go, do I understand the context of this poem? Do I understand the central message of this poem? So your context of the poem is what is happening in the poem? What is the um, structure within the poem? What is the setting of the poem, as it were? So let's try and phrase that in a, a little bit more um, form, better formed English. Clearly, I'm my brain's a little bit on holiday still, so I'm going to try and form, format that into better English, and we're going to make a note on that quickly. So the context of the poem, uh, the context, am I typing? There we go. Okay, so what is happening in and around the poem? What is the setting? What's the general action of the poem? So I want you to look at the difference 
as we go into the central message of the poem, because context and message are not the same, sometimes they can overlap. Sometimes there can be some bridging between the two, but they are separate ideas. And you need to understand that when it comes to the types of questions that you're getting in the exams. So the central message of the poem is really about what is it that the poet wants you to learn? What is it that the poet wants you to walk away from the poem with? What do they want you to understand? What idea are they, and it's a complicated idea. It's not a one word idea, okay? What complicated idea do they want to get across to you? So the central message of the poem, the central message, Okay, that's a very simple way of putting it. Your central message is linked to theme, but theme gives you the beginning. Okay, so your theme might be an exploration of oppression, but then your central message would be um, the speaker. These are hypotheticals. I'm just making this up. So your theme could be oppression, but your central message might be um, the speaker shows that through resilience and determination, we can overcome oppression. So you're taking a broad view when you're going for that central message. You're zooming out and you're looking at the bigger picture, the bigger message. So you're moving away from the context to some extent to get a bigger, more global picture of what it is that you need to learn. So now that we know what context and central message are over here, we are going to just have a very quick stroll through those nine poems that you should already have done. We're still going to come back to the rest of this over here, but just have a quick look at these. Okay, so I'm going to say to you, and I just want you to think, just spend five seconds, if that thinking to yourself, What's the context of Sonnet 130? What's the central message of Sonnet 130? If you don't know that out of your head, you don't know this poem well enough to go and write an exam. So you need to go and study these things and make sure that you know that. So your Sonnet 130, your context is the speaker writes a poem in which he compares his lover um, to other high standards of beauty. Um, that's your context. But the central message is different to that. The central message is that the speaker shows us that false comparisons of beauty are not what make true love. What make true love are a real and genuine understanding of the beloved. Can you see how different those two things are? And as I said, don't write this down. The four or five poems that we're hopefully going to get a chance to look at today, we'll go into those in detail. So the child who was shot dead by soldiers and younger, context there is that that is apartheid South Africa during a time of protest um, and where we see police brutality. Context, what is happening, what's this, you know, where is the poem set, what is the time frame sort of thing. What is the central message? Now, if you think of the final lines of that poem and you think of the giant who travels the world without a pass, that's where that central message is coming in. The central message there is that despite the oppression faced by people under apartheid, um, they were able to overcome that oppression through resilience and courage. Central message. At a funeral, I mean, that one gives you the context. The speaker is at a funeral for Valencia Majamboza. And she, you know, he's talking about the number of people who've died under apartheid. The message is that we must not, people of South Africa, people who are being oppressed, must not sit back and take that oppression. They must wholeheartedly fight that oppression. It's, remember that final line about it's better to die than not to fight. So think about that. 
your poem of return is a poem about the speaker Angolan, not South African. I saw a number of my learners, my kids getting confused here. They kept telling me that the poem of return, it's said in South Africa. It's not. If you do that in your context question, you're getting it wrong. So your context here is an Angolan speaker who has been exiled from his land of birth, from Angola, and he wishes to return home. So there's your context. What's your message? I found the message on this one a little bit trickier, but your message here is essentially that being exiled, while it might be safe, removes you from the ability to make change. And what the speaker most longs for is the ability to make change. Changes or the ability to fight for change is important. That might be part of your central message yet there as well. Talk to the peach tree. Your context is a list of absurd things that the speaker wants to speak to. Um, it's also within apartheid South Africa. So this is a South African poem. Um, there's a sense of these are things that cannot necessarily answer him. So there's context there. What's the message? Think again of those final lines where he says, come on, it's time to talk to the devil. The context there is it is time to overthrow oppression through engagement with the oppressor. So very, very different context versus central message. Your prayer to masks, please also note that's not South African. Leopold Sadar Senghor is Senegalese. So here your context is within um, colonial Africa and the speaker is praying to his ancestors asking for help to overthrow co colonialism. Um, your central message, think of that final line again, um, the central message is, remember that the African men dancing on the hard ground. So the, the central message is that oppression can be overcome through the energy and vitality of the African people. Also, just that one particular poem just makes me remember as well, some of these poems are going to have more than one central message. They're going to have more than one idea that they are sharing, especially if you've got a poem where the structure sort of shifts halfway through, or you've got one focus in one part of the poem and another focus in another part of the poem. So yes, you can learn a central message, but you also have to look at what that question is asking. And is that the central message you think? Think the question is going for or is there another central message that you can also bring in on that question then we've got this winter coming south african again the context is apartheid um, it suggests that violence is coming because of the oppression of apartheid um, and your central message is how um, oppression will cause those people oppressed to fight back and overthrow that oppression Solitude, one of the poems that we're going to be doing. So I'm going to skip that. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. So we'll come to the central message and the, the context of solitude. But the morning sun is shining. The context is the poet is, uh, the speaker is writing a poem about enjoying the beautiful natural scenery around her. And then she realizes that there is a beloved who is not there to enjoy the scenery with her. Now, here you can see how the context really feeds into the central message of this one. Um, and the central message of this one is when you have suffered loss, when someone you love deeply has been taken from you, life begins to lose its meaning. The beauty within life it becomes meaningless. So very quick overview of the nine poems that we should have done already. As, as I said, we'll come back to solitude in terms of what is context? What is the central message? Okay. So I think we can close that now and come back here. So your structure of the poem, you will find questions that ask about structure. We didn't get that in um, the uh, June common paper, but we don't know what's coming in finals. And we have seen questions in finals where they ask about structure. So when you're thinking about structure, you're thinking to yourself, is this... Free verse, OK, 
Okay. And then you need to know, and here I'm just going to give you some pointers on structure, but I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Okay. So just jot down these ideas, but listen to my explanations of them. So if something is written in free verse, it's very often going to link to ideas of free flowing sort or following a train, a passage of sort. Um, versus if something is very highly structured um, like a um, sonnet okay so your sonnet like sonnet 130 you have a very specific structure that's a shakespearean sonnet so you have 14 lines and you've got your um three quatrains followed by a rhyming couplet and in that rhyming couplet and this is why it's important to understand structure you're going to see that there's a comment made on those first three quatrains so you need to understand how that structure affects the meaning of the poem they're never going to say to you what type of poem is this or um what is the rhyme scheme in this poem? That might happen in a first additional paper. It's not going to happen in a home language paper. Here, it's about how does the structure affect the meaning, okay? So we've got things like free verse. We've got sonnet. We've got um, rhyme scheme. So again, how would the rhyme scheme affect the meaning? If we've got a very rigid rhyme scheme and suddenly the writer breaks that rhyme scheme, there we've got meaning being created why have they broken the rhyme scheme there what is the point of breaking it there similar with a rhythm scheme so rhythm in the poem you're looking at the number of syllables per line is it a metered line so does it have a set number of syllables per line when you read it and the morning sun is shining is a great example of this as well when you read it, can you hear the beat of the poem? So if I'm thinking of the morning sun is shining, I can hear that rhythm. Da 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 da. Okay. We've got a rhythm to the poem. And the poem sort of carries on in this nice, happy sing song rhythm until the end, until she shifts into that moment where she says, So what is what is sunshine? What is laughter without you? And that shift in rhythm is part of the meaning. We've got a happy, upbeat, we can't ever use the word happy. We've got a joyful, upbeat um, rhythm, and suddenly it becomes quite stern and forceful towards the end because there's a sense of loss. So we're looking at free verse, we're looking at sonnet, we're looking at rhyme scheme, we're looking at things like enjambment, if I can spell it correctly, because I don't have spell check on this, enjambment. Sorry, my kids know, this is partly how I teach irony, uh, my spelling is not great, okay. So if you pick up a spelling mistake, you're welcome to post it in the chat. Um, so in German, does the line flow on over various lines? You know, does the sentence or the meaning flow on over various lines? When it does that, why is it doing that? It gives a sense of movement and freedom, etc. Normally, okay, it's going to feed into the meaning. And then if you suddenly within this poem that's got lots of enjambment, lots of free flowing, get a short little sentence that creates a line and then maybe another short little sentence that is shifting. It's moving away from the enjambment into something that's harsher. It's going to affect your meaning. So in the structure of the poem, you need to have a vague idea. What is the structure of the poem? How does it affect the meaning of this particular poem? Then you should have a general idea of diction and imagery. Now, when I say you should have a general idea of diction and imagery, and I've now closed that image, but let me see if I can find it quickly. Yeah, there we go. Okay. If you're looking at your list and you're preparing for studying, I'm looking at my list of Sonnet 130. I don't need to know every single um, image or moment of word choice in terms of diction when I'm just looking at the title. If I'm looking at the poem, I should be able to unpack all of it. Okay, this is my test for myself when I'm studying. But when I'm looking just at the title and I'm recalling, I'm doing that active recall to go, do I know enough here? I should be able to say, oh yeah, he compared her lips to coral and he compared her breasts to dun and her hair to wires. Yeah, yeah, I remember this. Um, and what else did he say about her? Oh, he said that her voice was 
um, not musical, but he kind of liked to listen to it. And he said, so can you do that just looking at the title of your poem? Okay. When you look at the entirety of the poem, you need to be able to unpack it in its entirety. That's another level of studying. So when you start studying, come to a list of poems and see for yourself, how much can I recall? What's the content, context? What's my central message? What's my structure? What are some of the images and what's some of the diction that I can recall? And then when you go into your actual studying, you're going to go back to the poem and you're going to go and see, oh, yes, I can actually, I do know what it means. Let's talk to the swallows visiting in, in, us in summer or ask how, you know, I know what it means when he says, let's raise our pets to our level. So you want to make sure that when you look at the poem, you can unpack everything. But if you're just looking at the title, you should already have a whole lot of stuff in your head because that's really going to help you to write. So then the next thing in terms of how to approach your paper too is you have to have a general understanding of how to respond to specific question types. But what you must remember is that question types are going to be tweaked. So we used question types in this common paper based on a previous matric paper, based on last year's matric paper, if I'm not mistaken. We don't know what question types exactly they're going to give you at the end of this year. But if you've got a good understanding of these basic question types and you are careful in your reading of question types, then you should be fine. Don't assume, though, if you go in and you see a question about attitude over here, that let me just turn my highlighter on instead of that so if you see about a question about attitude over there that that is automatically yeah there we go it's highlighted that you know exactly how to answer that question look carefully at the question to see what is it actually asking me about attitude or what is it actually asking me about diction or imagery and then look at how to answer it so what we're going to do, we've got four question types, okay, we've got three poems. So what I'm going to do as I go through the poems, I'm going to discuss these first two uh, question types as we look at the first poem. Um, and then the third, the second poem, I'm going to discuss the third question type. And then I'm going to discuss the fourth question type. Let me rephrase that. What I mean by that, I mean, we're going to look at all these question types as we go through each poem, but I'm going to get you to write down in here how to go about answering. On the first poem, we're going to write down one and two. On the second poem, we're going to write down three. And on the third poem, we're going to write down four. Don't worry if it sounds confusing. Uh, as we do it, it will make a lot more sense. Okay, so let's have a look at our first poem. Our first poem is Talk to the Peach Tree. So before we even look at question types, let's just think to ourselves, okay, we've already discussed the context. We know it's apartheid South Africa. I think something else that's important to remember here is that Sipo Sipamla, his writing was banned. And so he could not write overt direct attacks against the apartheid governments because his writing would be censored. So his attacks on the apartheid government are made using um, metaphor. And we see this list of metaphor running through the poem um, where he is essentially, even though it's not, it doesn't necessarily read as an attack, a direct attack on the apartheid government. If we understand the context of the poem, if we understand that it was written during apartheid, that it was written as a criticism of the apartheid government, then we know that all of those metaphors, all of those images are an attack on the apartheid government. So we'll read the poem quickly. Um, I'm not doing loads of revision today. It's quick revision. And then we'll get into our um, questions that we've got here. So talk to the peach tree, Sipo Sipamla. Let's talk to the swallows visiting us in summer. Ask how it is in other countries. Let's talk to the afternoon shadow. Ask how the day has been so far. Let's raise our pets to our level. Ask them what they don't know of us. Words have lost meaning. Like all notations, they've been misused. Most people will admit, 
a whining woman can overstate her case. Talk to the paralyzing heat in the air. Inquire how long the mercilessness will last. Let's pick out items from the rubbish heap. Ask how the stench is like down there. Let's talk to the peach tree. Find out how it feels to be in the ground. Let's talk to the moon going down. Ask if it isn't enough, iron, what's been going on. Come on, let's talk to the devil himself. It's about time. So as a quick recap of that poem, we have a list of almost absurd, crazy, nonsensical things that he's suggesting we talk to. And he's using those crazy, nonsensical things to show that at this point, discussion, words have lost meaning. And it's also suggested right at the end of the poem that part of the reason for that is because we're not speaking to the right people. We're not speaking to the oppressor and we're not changing what the oppressor is doing. So he gives us this list of crazy things to talk to because he wants us to understand that words have lost meaning. They're being overused. It's time for more direct action. The list of crazy things that he's getting us to talk to, though, all have a metaphorical meaning. So your swallows visiting us in summer, these are migratory birds, so they can see what it's like in countries that are not suffering the kind of oppression apartheid is suffering. They can comment on that oppression and say, listen, this oppression is wrong. Let's talk to the afternoon shadow, ask how the day has been so far. So we might think that the afternoon shadow doesn't know anything, but that shadow has followed the day. Even though the shadow is insubstantial, it's there, it's seen everything. The other thing about a shadow is a shadow is insubstantial or it's dark, it's hidden. So you might think, okay, so what's been hidden away? What have we tried to hide? What is the apartheid government trying to hide? This um, stanza over here is very, very sarcastic. Let's raise our pets to our level, ask them what they don't know of us. So he's suggesting in this image that what the apartheid government have done is they have treated the oppressed people, people of color, like animals, like pets. And in doing so, he's suggesting if you raise those people up and you ask them what they know about the oppressor, what they know about the people that have put them in that position, they will know an enormous amount. I mean, I think for myself of, of my dogs that are always in the house, always on the beds and on the furniture, and they know everything about me because they see it all. So he's suggesting the same thing here, but he's also commenting on what it is that the apartheid government have done. They've treated people of color as if they are animals, as if they are less than uh, the owner of the animal. And here's where he goes into words have lost meaning, okay? You know, these are nonsensical conversations we're having. Even though we're still managing to draw meaning out of these first three stanzas, he's saying this is crazy, okay? We've misused our words, notations. We've misused our words. Most people will admit a whining woman can overstate her case. I always struggle a bit with that line. I'm not going to get too much into it here, but uh, I think... He's comparing the apartheid government to a whining woman and saying that she's moaning a lot um, and that um, we shouldn't listen to her. It's a bit sexist, but, you know, that's what it was in its time. Talk to the paralyzing heat in the air. Inquire how long the mercilessness will last. So the paralyzing heat is the oppressive apartheid government. And we'll get into the words paralyzing and heat just now because that's one of our questions. It's merciless because the apartheid government showed no mercy. They just kept on doing what they were doing. They kept on not caring about the people of the country, the people of color in the country. Um, this is also one that we'll look at in one of the questions. Let's pick out items from the rubbish heap. Ask how the stench is like down there. So just as with um, lines five and six, lines 13 and 14, 
He's suggesting that the apartheid government have treated people of color like rubbish. But if we go to those people of color and we say, what is your living condition like? They will be able to tell us just how disgusting, how um, much suffering they have because of that word stench. Let's talk to the peach tree, find out how it feels to be in the ground. This is one of the few positive images in the poem. Um, there is one, the first one might be, um, or it's at least not sort of overtly negative in the way that some of the other images are, but this one is a positive image. Find out how it feels to be in the ground. So if we think of the symbolism of a peach tree, we think of some a tree that grows fruit, that is soft and juicy, um, that is nourishing. Uh, being in the ground suggests being rooted, being connected to your culture. And of course, those are all things that were denied people of color under the apartheid regime because they weren't allowed to own land. They weren't allowed to live where they wanted to. The apartheid government would forcibly remove them into um areas designated based on their color. Let's talk to the moon going down, ask if it isn't enough eyeing what's been going on. So it suggests that the moon that is up every night can see all the goings on and that it's it's enough. It's time that this all stopped. And then we get the come on. So notice that short little line, that forceful line, let's talk to the devil himself. The devil here is the apartheid government and it's about time. So we need change to happen now. Okay, so that's a very quick rundown of that poem. So when we look at 2.1 and 2.2, we're going to discuss first, we're going to write down how to answer these questions, and then we're going to come back and answer them. Okay, so we'll just read this one here, and then we'll scroll up, or you can just move up on your notes and fill in. So refer to line 11. Now, just so that you're aware, normally they would quote the section of line 11 that they specifically want you to look at. To save space, I've highlighted whatever, or put in bold, whatever section they wanted you to look at, okay? So refer to line 11, and here it's the entire line 11. What does the paralyzing heat suggest about the apartheid government in the context of the poem? So this is a two-mark question. Because it's a two-mark question, and it's an entry-level question, we don't actually need to get too much into the context of the poem here. When we look at um, question three, here we actually need to be specific. 2.3, okay? We need to be specific about the context of the poem. But over here, we don't really need to mention it. What we do need to do is we need to unpack both of those words and then link it to what it tells us about the apartheid government. So let's go back up here and just fill this in. So when we've got a question, what does the whatever suggest about whatever in the context of the poem? You're going to make a quick note on how to answer this question type. For this question type, I need to unpack and explain carefully whatever is in quotes. So whatever is in quotes in the first section of the question, okay? Then I, then I need to link that explanation to the second part. In other words, the suggest about part. Okay, so that's how we answer that first one. So let's go and have a look at how we would answer this question. Refer to line 11. Talk to the paralyzing heat in the air. What does the paralyzing heat suggest about the apartheid government in the context of the poem? So just before I type in the answer, just think to yourself, what does it suggest? What does paralyzing mean? Okay, I'm going to have a sip of my juice. 
So the word paralyzing emphasizes how the apartheid government made it impossible to fight back because it prevented people from doing anything. Okay, so that's not great because it's over the two lines. Let's see if we can make it bigger. I'll just do this. And I don't like the doing anything because it's a bit it's a bit vague. It prevented people from, um, and I can't say fighting back because I've already said that it prevented people from acting forcefully to stop the oppression. Not vague, okay? So you always want to avoid vagueness, and. I want to link this to the apartheid government. The word heat emphasizes, and I'm going to link this section here, the word heat emphasizes the pain and suffering that apartheid caused. Because that, you know, if you think of heat and you bring it close to your body and it's paralyzing heat, it's going to be pain and suffering. So that's an entry-level question. You literally, you're unpacking those words and you're making sure that in unpacking them, you are connecting it to the apartheid government. So what would be an example of an answer that doesn't connect it to the apartheid government? An example of an answer that wouldn't work. Let me just see if I can find a little bit of space. Okay, so I'm just going to write up here. So if I gave an answer like this and I said, <laughs> not there, let me find where I want to be. I want to be here. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay. It's doing a weird thing. Maybe I can do it. I'll try one more time. Yes, okay, it's letting me type. Par wow, I'm going to open up a document and just type in a document quickly. So here's an example of a entry-level question where it says, or answer where it says, what does this suggest about that? And if I didn't connect it to the apartheid government in this particular one. So if I said something like paralyzing heat suggests that you are unable to fight uh, because you are in pain. Okay. I have not connected that answer to the apartheid government. So even though I don't get a mark here specifically to the apart, you know, for saying apartheid government, I need to be able to show that I understand what this paralyzing me heat means in the context of the poem. So here I would need to, to make this a two mark response. I would need to say paralyzing heat suggests that you are unable to fight. So there's my paralyzing because you are in pain caused by the apartheid regime. So now suddenly I've connected it to the context. So that's how you connect it to the context in this entry level question, okay? You're just connecting it back to the thing that they are asking you about. Here, you're not getting a mark for that context. The mark is still gonna actually be here and here, but if you don't show the context, they couldn't give you two marks for this because you would be too general. So if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be able to get that mark because what am I talking about? Paralyzing heat. I need to understand apartheid government. So let's go back over here. Then we've got 2.2. Refer to lines 13 to 14. So here's lines 13 to 14. Let's pick out items from the rubbish heap. Ask how the stench is like down there. Explain what these lines convey about the attitude of the speaker towards the oppressive regime. If you guys have forgotten what attitude is, just make a little arrow somewhere on your page to the word attitude. Your attitude is a one word emotion that shows how the speaker feels. In this case, it's the speaker because we're being asked about the attitude of the speaker. But you could get the attitude of a character as well, okay? 
to your attitude is a one word emotion that shows how the speaker feels. I like to tell my kids to give two one word emotions just in case the the first one they give is not great. So maybe the second one is a little bit more punchy or maybe between the two attitude words, they're actually getting to the correct attitude. So what I thought I'd do as well, um, because I'm hoping at this point that you guys all know that you can't use happy, sad, positive, negative as attitudes. You won't get marks for them. Okay, You can say, oh, the speaker has a negative attitude. You will get zero for that because it's not specific enough. Neither is happy or sad specific enough. So what I thought I would do is with each attitude question, I'm just going to introduce you to three attitude words and I'll give you like a teeny bit of time. We don't have a lot of time, a teeny bit of time just to write down those three attitude words ish. So by the end of this, you should have a decent list of 12 attitude words, which should be helpful in many contexts. Remember, attitude can be similar to mood, which is the general feeling that the writing creates. Um, but it is distinct from mood. So mood is the feeling or the, the way the speaker feels about something. So let's look at three attitude words. What I've done is I've just highlighted them in purple, the ones that I want to look at with you now. And of course, that's not working because I'm in a different program. So we'll make that bigger. OK, so the first one that we're going to look at that you guys can write down very quickly is the word cynical. Okay, so cynical is when you don't believe that something is true or genuine. You are going to be that person who's always questioning if you are a cynical person. You're always going to think, mm, I'm not sure I trust that person. I don't trust their sincerity. I'm not sure that they're good. So a cynical tone or attitude questions the basic sincerity and goodness of people. Don't worry about any of the other colors right now. We'll do those with the other poem, with the other poems. So we've got cynical, okay? Then we've got disillusioned. And disillusioned, the, the explanation there of disappointed, disappointed is a, a very acceptable tone that you can also use. So you've got two tone words there. So if you're disillusioned, you're disappointed in someone or something, you don't believe that that thing is ever going to come right, okay? Um, I might say, I'm disillusioned uh, with crime in South Africa. Or no, actually, I, would, I wouldn't say that. I would say I'm disillusioned with the police in South Africa. And that would suggest that I'm disappointed that they're not doing enough to combat crime. So that's disillusioned. Did I do a third one in purple? No, I didn't. I didn't do a third one because disappointed is another tone word, is another attitude word. So we've actually got three words there. So we've got three words to play with now. So the speaker's attitude is, I'm going to go with disillusioned. Or cynical, okay? So the speaker's attitude is disillusioned or disappointed. Let's fill that in here. And I get a mark for that, disillusioned or disappointed. And it's a good idea to actually write those words when you are answering a question like this. If you don't write the speaker's attitude is, at least write the speaker feels so that you remember to get to that emotion that they are feeling. So the speaker feels disillusioned or disappointed. I can see this because the writer shows. So here is your evidence, your explanation for what the attitude is. Where are you getting the evidence for this, this attitude for, from? I can see this because the writer shows how Terrible living conditions in, I'm going to say squatter camps, and I'm going to show you what I'm going to do here. In brackets, I'm going to quote rubbish heap, okay, are because he describes their inch. Let me make another enter there. He describes their stench. And 
And I might even say, if I want to be a bit extra, he is disappointed by the apartheid government. So there I've got my two marks. So I think we didn't write down our 2.2 here, but I'm just going to leave this here for a second. So the speaker's attitude is disillusioned or disappointed, and I give my evidence for this. We can see this because the writer shows how terrible living conditions in squatter camps that rubber sheep are because he describes their stench. Um, that leads me to the terrible conditions. He is disappointed by the apartheid government. Okay. Um, so we're going to go back here because I realized we didn't do this. Explain what these words, what these lines convey about the attitude of the speaker towards whatever that is. Okay. So with a question like this, I need to make sure I must name the speaker's attitude. And I'm going to put your one word motion. I'm also going to say it is a good idea to give more than one one word emotion. Then I must explain how I got to that attitude. And I must do that based on the lines that I'm given, okay? Um, and I've left that in square brackets up here in the question. Explain what these lines convey about the attitude of the speaker towards. You need to look at what is the, the attitude towards. That's going to guide you in your answer. You're not just going in and going, oh, his attitude is whatever. You might look very specifically at um, what his attitude is or her attitude is towards that specific thing. Because you can, doesn't happen often, but you can have two different attitudes towards two different things in one quote. So be careful to make sure that you're giving the attitude for that specific thing over there. So we've got our first two question types. Um, let's get back to this. So this question type 2.3, when we get to 3.3, we'll write down that question type, how to approach it. So refer to lines 15 to 16. Discuss the effectiveness of the image in the context of the poem. So previously I said up here, you know what, you don't need over here, I said you don't need to actually like give a whole thing about the context. You just need to sort of mention it like apartheid, okay? That's enough in that entry-level question. But this is no longer an entry-level question. So here, your context of the poem actually needs a bit of fleshing out, a bit of detail. When you're looking at the image, what you're making sure that you're doing is you're unpacking the metaphor or you're explaining the simile or the personification or you're looking at the um, alliteration, you're explaining it. What you're not getting a mark for is saying this is a metaphor or this is a simile. You can do that to help yourself and to go in the metaphor, this is what the speaker is doing, but you, you won't get a mark for naming it. Okay, So you're going to unpack the image. You're going to say what the poem is about, the context. And then this effectiveness here, what is the image doing? What is the image showing or suggesting? Okay, so the way in which I've set up the, the sort of standard response here, and I really do, I'm going to hopefully keep saying this so that you remember, I really do encourage you to use the language of the question in your answer so that you can see, am I actually getting to each little section that I need to get to? Am I getting to... I'm not finding what I'm watching. It's fine. Am I getting to context? Am I getting to image? Am I getting to effectiveness? So use the language of the question and the answer. The image of the peach tree shows. Okay. So, or the image of the peach tree is, or the image of the peach tree compares, whatever it is, you're going to put that in there. You're going to say, in the context of the poem, 
or in the context the poem is about or the context of the poem is. So you use that language. The image suggests, the image um, effectively shows. So you just making sure that you're hitting all the beats of that question. So the image of the peach tree shows, and remember it's lines 15 to 16. Let's talk to the peach tree, find how it feels to be in the ground, okay? The image of the peach tree shows, um, or the image of the peach tree, yeah, let's work with shows, a tree that is deeply rooted in the ground. A peach tree has sweet fruit and symbolizes and like most trees symbolizes life okay so now i'm going to look at in the context of the poem in the context of or i'm even going to say in the context of um apartheid south africa where people of color were not allowed to own land. The image suggests that the speaker wants to find out what it feels like to be connected to the land and to feel a sense of belonging. Okay, so let's just have a quick look at what I've done here. Just as a reminder, the image of the peach tree, so I'm discussing what that image, I'm sort of unpacking it, a tree that is deeply, the image of the peach tree shows a tree that is deeply rooted in the ground. A peach tree is sweet fruit and like most trees symbolizes life. In the context of apartheid South Africa, where people of color are not allowed to own land, the image suggests that the speaker wants to find out what it feels like to be connected to the land and to feel a sense of belonging. Now, I want you guys to do this when you write your answers as well. Um, one of the things that I do want to say, so that you have some understanding of my process here, um, you have the memo, or at least I've sent the memo for this paper with the questions that we've done. Um, you will see if you look at the memo that my answers are not memo perfect. I do the answer as, as I'm presenting because I want you to see the process that I go through of creating an answer. And because there is no answer there's, there's no way I can walk into an exam paper or you can walk into an exam paper and go, oh, I've got this answer memorized. I'm just going to put it down. You can't do that. It's a process where you have to look at the question and read through your answer as you are going. So I'm reading through my answer again. I'm rereading it and I'm thinking, you know what I've done? I spoke here about sweet fruit and life, but I haven't actually picked up on that in my effectiveness statement here. So the image suggests that the speaker wants to find out what it feels like to be connected to the land and to feel a sense of belonging. Um, the peach tree or the use of the, Im or the, u the image of the peach tree, there we go, the image of the peach tree. suggest that the speaker would like people of color to experience a sweet and joyous life. Now I've connected it back, okay? And I only realized that I didn't connect it when I reread my answer. So please, as you are writing your own answers, reread them, double check. Did I unpack the image? Did I give the context of the poem? Did I say what that image is doing? What the effect of that image is? Okay. So now let's have a look at lines 19 to 21. Come on, let's talk to the devil himself. It's about time. Critically discuss how these lines convey the central message of the poem. Okay. 
So what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to unpack the lines and then I'm going to name or discuss the central message. So I'm going to say here, to means underline. These lines show that I want to be able to see my lines as I'm writing. Um, feels impatient to, and I'm going to put the come on in brackets there, to speak, to approach, actually let's go with to confront, to confront the apartheid regime. And I'm going to put the devil himself. by referring to the apartheid regime as the devil, it clearly shows that he believes this regime to, this regime to be evil. And I could discuss a little bit more about this. I could talk about it's about time and say um, people have suffered long enough. It needs to be fixed now. Um, so there's more that I could say here, but I feel like I've got enough for two marks worth of response. So the speaker feels impatient to confront the apartheid regime. And by referring to the apartheid regime, regime as the devil, it clearly shows that he believes this regime to be evil. This conveys the central message that um, it is time to put an end to the suffering of the oppressed people in South Africa. This can only be done through direct conversation with those in power. Okay, so there we go. I've got that down. Um, I need to speed up. I'm just looking at the time. Um, I don't think we're going to have time to take a break. Uh, but Miss Raycliffe, if you want me to take a break, just interrupt me in five minutes because that would be the hour mark. Um, and we can take a, a quick breather, but otherwise I'm just going to keep tracking. So our next poem is Solitude, Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Um, this is a great poem to get in finals because the central message is pretty much restated in every single line. So it's quite easy to get to the central message of this poem. So the context, remember I said we discussed this. The context of the poem is someone who is reflecting on the nature of human beings. She's thinking through a whole series of scenarios about what people are like in different um, scenarios. I didn't want to use the word again, but what people are like in different contexts. And the central message of the poem is essentially that as human beings, we will suffer alone. When we are joyful, we will have plenty of support and friends. But when we are suffering and in pain, we will be alone. So it's quite a negative view, cynical view of hu humanity. So we'll do a quick skim through the poem. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this one because I do think it's pretty easy. I will focus this one just on the questions that we're going to do once I've done the read through. So laugh and the world laughs with you. Weep and you weep alone. For the sad old earth must borrow its mirth but has trouble enough of its own. Sing and the hills will answer Sigh, it is lost on the air. The echo is bound to a joyful sound, but shrink from voice and care. Rejoice and men will seek you, grieve, and they turn and go. They want full measure of all your pleasure, but they do not need your woe. Be glad and your friends are many, be sad and you lose them all. There are none to decline your nectared wine, but alone you must drink life's gall. 
Feast and your halls are crowded, fast and the world goes by. Succeed and give and it helps you live, but no man can help you die. There is room in the halls of pleasure for a large and lordly train, but one by one we must all file on through the narrow aisles of pain. So just very quickly something about the structure. You've pretty much got, and obviously you know that you're not you're not going to say positive, negative, but just for explanation purposes here, you've got a positive in line one, negative in line two, um, sort of positive in line three, negative, positive over here, negative, positive, negative. So you've got just positive, negative, positive, negative. And it continues throughout. Be glad, be sad. Uh, here you've got nectared wine, so it's nice sweet wine. Gall is bitter and disgusting tasting. All the way through, you've got negative, positive, negative, positive. Uh, there is room in the halls of pleasure for a large and lordly train. So here suddenly you've got two lines that focus on, on positives. But here, the end of the poem is two lines that focus on negatives. So she's broken the rhythm. She's broken the structure of positive, negative, positive, negative. And then she goes positive, positive, negative, negative. And what do we remember most? The two negative lines that she's ended on. By having those two lines as her last lines, that is what she's emphasizing. She's emphasizing that idea just in terms of the structure. Um, and then are there any words that I think we... I'm hoping that you guys have done this already, but you know that mirth is joy, um, woe is deep sorrow. I'm just trying to see if there's anything. Your halls here don't refer to like a passageway down your house. Uh, in your house, your halls here refer to like a big banquet hall. Think of a town hall, okay? So you've got a big banquet hall, okay? Um, and a large and lordly train. This is not a train that you catch at the station. A train is a group of people who walk behind the king or queen, okay? There's a train of people who walks behind them. They're like attendants. So if you've got a large and lordly train, you've got a lot of people walking behind you, looking after your every need. So that's a very quick skim through on this poem. As I said, I'm going to speed up a bit on this one because it is an easier mm -hmm. poem. So 3.1, refer to line 7 to 8. There's line seven to eight. What do the, the echoes suggest about people in this world? So this is a two marker. And where I saw people struggled with this is they just spoke about the echoes and they forgot to go back and look about what the echoes are doing in line seven to eight. Because the echoes in line seven to eight are doing two different things. If you think about your structure, you've got positive and negative, positive and negative. So your structure is picking up on that. So the echoes bound to a joyful sound, but shrink from voice and care. So to bound is to, to jump or to bounce. And it's a, a jolly sort of image, you know, if you're bounding with joy. But shrink, you're pulling in, you're avoiding. So the echoes suggest that people will respond with, uh, I can't say happiness, I'm going to use a word from the poem, with mirth and joy when you are um, joyful, but People will avoid you and pull away when you are uh, melancholy. So I'm using another word instead of sad. Not melancholy, melancholy. Okay. So pretty easy answer. That's your entry level question. And I've made sure two marks. This only gave me one word to look at. Okay. The echoes. Unlike my 2.1 where it said paralyzing heat. So I knew I needed to um, talk about both. But here, what do the words echo suggest about people in this world? If I go back and I look 
at those lines, I can see echoes are doing two different things. So with a two mark question, I know I need to speak about the two different things that the echoes are doing and what they suggest about people. So I'm not saying that the echoes respond when you are happy and that the echoes don't respond when you are happy. I am saying that the people will respond with mirth and joy when you are joyful and the people will avoid you and pull away when you are melancholy. So now we've got our attitude question and you know how to answer this because you know your attitude is a one-word emotion. You're going to give two one-word emotions. How does the speaker feel about something? And we're going to look at how does the speaker feel towards society? And then I can see this because, so we're proving this because. So that little purple highlight over there is my reminder to go and look at the purple highlights on my sheet. So we're looking at these lines here. They want full measure of all your pleasure, but they do not need your woe. So I'm referring to lines 11 and 12, and I'm looking for an attitude here. So I'm going to slow down a bit so that you can write down some attitudes. Did I get my colors a bit mixed up? I think I might have. Please excuse me while I double check something. Oh, I've got them both in purple, which means that I must have changed something while I was prepping this morning. So that is fine. We will just roll with the, the issues. Um, I do think you can go with critical. So you could say that this is a she's got a critical attitude towards people. She finds fault with them. I wouldn't go with indignant. I think indignant was probably um, based on the first one that I was doing. So this is where my color was wrong. I think my color should have been yellow on my first one. But write down this tone attitude word anyway because we're adding to your bank of tone attitude words so if you're indignant you are angry because you think something is unfair okay it's a great word if you feel indignant at something you're angry because you think something is unfair and that definitely works with the peach tree indignant doesn't work with um what she what uh, solitude over here and let's just look at bitter. This also works with peach tree. Exhibiting strong animosity. Animosity is hatred as a result of pain or grief. And I do think that works there as well. Okay, so you've just added to your tone words. But we're looking at the purple ones because it was the purple ones that I highlighted for this poem. And I just made a mistake in highlighting my first poem in purple instead of yellow. So we're going to look at cynical. We're going to look at disillusioned or disappointed because she is those things. Okay, so the speaker's attitude is, and the great thing about the mistake that I made here, by the way, is that you can see how easy it is to reuse your tone and attitude words because a lot of them come up time and time again. I mean, melancholy comes up so often. So if you have a bank of these words, you'll see how easy it becomes to answer tone and attitude questions. If you've got six, ten of these words, you're going to be A for a way. So the speaker's attitude is disappointed and disillusioned. Yeah, I think you could do disillusioned again here. Um, and I can see this because she shows how, sorry, that's my dog yawning in the background. She shows how people will want to have, she shows how society and why am I doing that? I've reread my answer as I'm typing and I go, oh, it's the speaker's attitude towards society. So I'm just making sure that I'm connecting the quick answer to the question. She shows how society uh, will want to share extensively. That's the full measure in, let me make another entry, in your joy and celebration but they are not interested, interested in sharing your pain or woe. 
Okay, so I've shown where that disappointed or disillusion comes from. Without, hopefully without confusing anyone, but I just want to go back and look. So my yellow ones here, critical, bitter, and indignant, were the ones that I should have had for that first poem. So I just want to go back and show you that they would work there as well. So bitter, critical, and indignant. So if I look here on my 2.1, the speaker's attitude is bitter, critical, or indignant because he shows how terrible living conditions in squat squatter camps are because he describes their stench, especially that indignant, angry at an injustice. Can you see how angry at an injustice and indignant would work here? Because it's unjust, it's unfair that people of color under apartheid were treated in this way. Okay, so that was me just going back. I'm going to jump forward again, back into the poem that we're meant to be busy on. Okay, so we've done our 3.1, we've done our 3.2, and now we're going to look at 3.3, and we're going to make notes on how to answer this question type. So we have already answered one of these question types, but this is where we're going back up and we're just filling in that information. So we're referring to lines 17 to 18. Feast and your halls are crowded, fast and the world goes by. Discuss the effectiveness of the image in the context of the poem. So as per last time, I'm looking at this idea of unpacking the image, explaining the image in terms of the context of the poem. I'm saying what's going on in the poem? What's the, the general things that are being explored? What's the action in the poem? And then I'm saying what is this image actually doing in my poem? Okay, so we're going to just make some notes on this at the top of our sheet here. So discuss the effectiveness of the image in the context of the poem. You'll see that in all of my answers, my, my demo answers that I've put together here, that I've started with image, then I've gone to context, then I've gone to effectiveness. You don't need to do that. And there are times when I find I need to start with context or um, it's very seldom that I'll start with effectiveness because I find that the effectiveness comes out of the image and the context together. But you don't need to have it in such a rigid order the way that I've got it. Remember that sometimes you're going to find it easier to work with a different order. But what you must do is you must look at using the language of the question in your answer so that you know what you're talking about. You're going, the image is about, okay? The context is about, and the effectiveness, the effect of this is, or this shows, or this suggests. Not only does it help you, but it helps the person marking your paper, especially at the end of the year, to go, okay, this is how the, this learner, this person has understood the context. This is how they've understood the effect. And it becomes a whole lot easier to mark, but it also becomes a whole lot easier to answer. I'm going to have another sip of juice quickly before I type this in. Okay, so for the image... I need to explain or unpack what the image is. So what is being compared to what? Um, for the context, I need to look at and explain what the what did we say about context is over here? We said what is happening in the poem? What is the setting? What is the general action of the poem? I need to look at and explain the setting or the general action of the poem. For effectiveness, I need to then show what the image is telling me or showing me. Okay, so what is the new information that that comparison is giving you? If you think about 
a metaphor or a simile or personification. When you compare one thing to something else, you're giving that thing the properties of that other thing. So let's say I've got a simile and I say um, I'm as lazy as a pig. Okay. Um, when I say that, I'm taking some of the properties of a pig and I'm attaching them not to me, but to my laziness. So when I think of a pig, what do I think of? I think of something, I think of something that's large, that carries a lot of weight, that doesn't move around a lot, that maybe only moves ar around a lot in search of food. Um, that uh, is covered in dirt, that spends a lot of time sleeping. So if I understand, if I say, discuss the effectiveness of the image, and now we don't have a context, right? Um, discuss the, the effectiveness of the image. The, Ms. Crumplin said she's as lazy as a pig. I'm going to say Ms. Crumplin is comparing her laziness to a pig. There is my image to a certain extent. Um, I'm going to give us some context here and I'm going to say uh, I am as lazy as a pig during the holidays. Okay, uh, So during the holidays, Ms. Crumplin does nothing. This image tells me, this image suggests to me that during the holidays, um, Ms. Crumplin is not particularly clean. Maybe this is not true, by the way. I do shower every day. This is just an example hopefully one you'll remember, uh, Ms. Crumplin doesn't shower every day. She eats a lot of food. She lies around on her bed, uh, maybe watching Netflix all day. Okay, so can you see how from that image of uh, the lazy pig, um, I can take the ideas associated with a pig and attach it to what it's being compared to, Ms. Crumplin's laziness. Does that make sense? I can't see you, so I don't know that it makes sense, but I hope that it makes sense. Okay, so we've got a general idea of how to answer that question now. Let's go back here and answer this one. The image of feasting and fasting shows. There we go. And I'm going to actually just suggest that for this one, we take this word shows out. Let me see if I can do that. I'm going to take the word shows out. There we go. I want to strike through. No. <laughs> okay, imagine the word shows is not there, that I've taken that word shows out and that I'm not trying to add a comment. So let's go back there and type text. So shows is not there. The image of feasting and fasting. Um, image of feasting and fasting. Is when... I, I'm going to use the word shows. I wasn't going to, but now I'm going to. Okay, so the word shows is back in. Sorry if you crossed it out. The image of the feasting and fasting shows a comparison to having an abundance of food. And lots of guests to not having any food and the, that's what fasting is here fasting here is not like religious fasting where you're fasting because you're purifying your body um and because you want to come come closer to god fasting here is you don't have anything okay so the image of feasting and fasting shows a comparison to having an abundance of food and lots of guests to not having any food and so having no companions, okay? In the context of the poem where the speaker explores how people suffer on their own but are surrounded by friends when they experience joy, the image suggests that, so now I need to get into what is this image showing me, the image suggests that when you have a lot of, when you have an abundance 
of happiness or reasons to celebrate, people will support you. But if you have nothing, people will pass you by. Okay. So this this particular poem, I did find like when I worked through this paper on my own, I did find this question a bit tricky, but it's because the poem is actually a little bit limited, which is a great thing. Okay, it's a great thing because she says the same thing over and over and over again, just in different ways. So if you get this poem, particularly for an essay, say thank you, because this you know exactly what the context of the poem is. You know exactly what the central message of this poem is. There's no confusion about it. Um, but sometimes it gets a bit difficult to separate the different elements out. So I'm just making sure that in each section, I'm not sort of overlapping what I'm saying. So the image of the feasting and the fasting shows a comparison to an abundance of food, that's my feast, and lots of guests, to not having any food and so having no companions. So I'm not explaining my image too much here. I'm not getting into the effect of the image just yet. In the context of the poem, where the speaker explores how people suffer on their own, but are surrounded by friends when they experience joy, the image suggests that when you have an abundance of happiness or reasons to celebrate, people will support you. But if you have nothing, people will pass you by. And also just be clear, one of the things that I'm purposefully doing as I'm answering this question is I'm purposefully making sure not to use the same words over and over again. Okay, just so that I'm bringing in some difference between what's my image, what's my context, what's my effectiveness. So that effectiveness part is what is the image doing? The image is suggesting that there's my effectiveness part. Now, 3.4, critically discuss how these lines convey the central message of the poem. So these lines show that. So I'm going to unpack these lines. And then I'm going to name the central message, okay? One by one, we must all file on through the narrow aisles of pain. So I'm just going to unpack these lines. These lines show that we will be alone. And I'm going to put one by one in brackets to show that that's where I'm getting it from. When we experience pain, okay? That's enough for one mark. That is definitely enough for one mark, but this is two marks based on these lines. So I know I need to discuss more here. So I've got into the one by one. We must all file on through the narrow aisles of pain. So there's quite a bit that I could discuss here. Um, I'm going to go with this, we must all file on um, and talk about the inevitability that you have to do it. Okay, so the word must suggests that we have to go through pain in life and that it is inevitable, okay? I could talk about the narrow aisles as well. Um, I'm not going to type that up again just because I'm keeping an eye on time and we need to finish at 12.15. But if I spoke about the narrow aisles, if I spoke about making the, myself breakfast, okay, make yourself breakfast at twenty to twelve. If you, if I spoke about the narrow aisles, I would speak about the fact that it's like a narrow passageway, and there's only space for one person at a time. So I could speak about that image as well. So these lines show that we will be alone one by one, when we experience pain. The word must suggests that we have to go through pain in life. And if I was writing this in exams, I'd probably underline have to, and that it is inevitable, like there's nothing we can do about it. This conveys the central message that pain and suffering will that during, now I don't want to repeat what I've just said in these lines. I want to put my central message into different words. That during pain and suffering, 
people will flee from us and not offer support. They will only be there for us when we are celebrating or joyful. And I'm going to be a little bit extra on this one just because, and I'm going to add a little bit more to the central message. During pain and suffering, people will flee from us and not offer support. They will only be there for us when we are celebrating or joyful. This shows an extremely cynical view of humanity and the lack of compassion. I'm busy teaching my love for their fellow. I'm waiting for it to catch up with me for their fellow human beings. Okay. There we go. Um, sorry, my son thinks that I'm, I mean, he doesn't think this, but I think he forgets um, because I'm just talking to a computer. He doesn't realize that there are many people who are currently listening to me. So I can't answer his questions about what he should have for breakfast at 20 to 12. So that's that one. Now we're going to pray to masks. I'm going to slow down a little bit on this one. Be, well, I don't have a lot of time to slow down, but I'm going to slow down a little bit on this one because it's a tough poem. Okay. So pray to masks. We know that the context, as we've already discussed, is um, that the speaker is asking for his ancestors to help the African people throw off the shackles of colonialism. That's your context. The central message, as I mentioned right at the beginning, it comes from that final line, which is that the people, the men of Africa, um, are capable of doing this because they are filled. The men of Africa are capable of throwing off oppression and colonialism because they are filled with power and energy and vitality. Okay. So pray to masks, black mask, red mask, you black and white masks, rectangular masks through whom the spirit breathes. I greet you in silence. So what he's doing here, and you too, my lion-headed ancestor, so what he's doing here in those opening lines is he is praying, I greet you in silence, to his ancestors, and his ancestors are masks. You guard this place that is closed to any feminine laughter, to any mortal smile. You purify the air of eternity here where I breathe the air of my fathers. So he sees the masks as uh, purifying and as protective. So he's got a lot of respect and reverence for these masks. The masks, the spirits, the ancestors do not have marks on their faces. They are free from dimples and wrinkles. Why? Because they're not human. They have ascended beyond the human plane and they've gone into the immortal world. As immortals, as spirits and ancestors, they don't age. They don't end up with wrinkles and dimples. You have composed this image, this my face that bends over the altar of white paper. So he's saying to his ancestors, he's acknowledging them for having created him. And he says, you've created my face that is bending over the altar of white paper. So that altar of white paper, it's the poem that he's writing. And it's an altar because it is in reverence, in respect, out of worship, to these ancestors that is writing the poem. So for my sake, in the name of your image, listen to me. And it's a desperate call there, a plea for them to listen to him. Now while the Africa of despotism is dying. So a despot is a cruel or tyrannical ruler. And so now while that type of rulership is dying in Africa, and that type of rulership could either be the colonial powers who were cruel and tyrannical, or it could be people, African people who were put in power by the co colonists and who ruled their own people in a cruel way. So there's two meanings that we've got there. 
And he describes their dying, their despotism, as the agony of a pitiful princess. So it's something that he thinks is scornful, something we should look down on. It's pitiful. It's it's not even worth the time of our day. He's not feeling genuine uh, concern for the Africa of despotism. Um, there's a level of sarcasm and scorn when he says that. And he says that Europe, the Europe of despotism, because the Europe is the ones, Europe is the one who set up those despotic powers in Africa, that's also dying. Now, while the Africa of despotism is dying, like that of Europe, so the agony is like that of Europe, to whom she is connected through the navel. Why is the Africa of, con of despotism connected to Europe through the navel? Because Europe sort of birthed her, Europe get, created this colonial situation. And he says, look at us uh, because we've been called to sacrifice our lives like the poor man, his last garment. So we will give everything for Africa in order to ensure that we can break this despotic situation so that hereafter we may cry here at the rebirth of the world. So we want to be present, the Africans want to be present when the world is reborn, not just Africa, because he sees African people as the leaven that can make white flour rise. So leaven is yeast. When you make bread, you put yeast in it and it rises. If you don't put leaven, if you don't put yeast in bread, it stays flat. So he sees the African people as this powerful force, this catalyst that will be able to help the world rise and overcome the position that it's in. Why does he see this? Because he sees that the African people can teach rhythm, movement to the world, a sense of joy and celebration. Why? Because the world has been killed by machines, the Industrial Revolution, that's what the machines stand for, and cannons, that would be your First and Second World War that he's referring to, but also just war generally. So there's been so much that's happened to the world at the time that he's writing this, which I believe was in the 1960s, it was prior to 1960. Um, so your cannons, the war, the world wars. And he says, who else should ejaculate the cry of joy that arouses the dead and the wise in a new joy, dawn? So who else could call people um, with this joyous cry that brings back the dead, that brings the wise to a new uh, life, a new way of being? Say, who else could return the memory of life to men with a torn hope? Only African people, he believes, can give people hope again when they only have the memory of life. They don't even have enough life to feel as if they've got a proper life. They call us cotton heads and coffee men and oily men. They call us men of death. So these are the pejoratives, the negative things that the uh, colonial oppressors refer to African men as, African people as. Cotton heads, it could refer to um, the hair of African people being cottony. It could refer to um, the notion that African people are somehow stupid, according to colonial people. The cotton heads might be an image, a derogatory image, to suggest that their brains are soft like cotton. Uh, coffee men could refer to the color of black people's skin, the dark skin. Oily men could suggest that the black people are seen as um, maybe not clean somehow. Um, but all three of those things are also, it's interesting that these negative um, racial stereotypes that are used here, where, where the speaker saying, this is how colonial people see us, all of those negative descriptors are also all products that raw materials that come from Africa. So very cleverly, our speaker, our writer, has used these pejorative terms, these derogatory terms, to also remind us that the colonial powers are taking cotton and coffee and oil from the African continent, or were doing that. In some instances, I 
they still are, even though they no more colonies left um, a lot of the wealth of Africa does still flow out of Africa because it's still owned by Europeans but that's a discussion for another day they call us men of death so the colonial powers don't see any sense of hope or energy or competence or ability within African people but then he says but and that's a really big but over there, we are the men of the dance. So we are not these men that they think we are. We dance suggests energy. It suggests vitality. It suggests joyfulness. And we are the men of the dance whose feet only gain power when they beat the hard soil. So when we're in contact with the African soil and we are dancing, that's where we gain our power. And the image suggests that the African people gain their power through reconnecting to their cultural roots. Okay, so we've got 10 minutes on this one. And then we need to spend 15 minutes on our poetry essay. Um, so let's go as quickly as we can. What do the words spirit breathes suggest about the masks? So that comes from this line and it's the entire line that would have been quoted, referred to line two. Rectangular masks through whom the spirit breathes. So what I've done here is just to make sure that you realize you have to actually speak about both words. You can't just talk about the word breathes. You can't just talk about the word spirits. It says, what do the words, plural, suggest about the ancestors? So the word spirit suggests that, or suggest about the masks, the word spirit suggests that the masks are his ancestors. Okay. Very easy spirits. Um, the word breathe suggests that these ancestors are alive or have a tangible the word tangible means that you can feel it they have you can experience it or have a tangible impact on his world okay so they're not just spirits in the sense that they're off in the corner and um, he never gets to interact with them. The notion of breathing suggests that they respond to him in some way because they are breathing. It suggests that they have some form of life force. Okay. Explain what these words convey about the speaker's attitude to the masks. So here we're looking at lines five to six. So this is lines five to six here. You guard this place that is closed to any feminine laughter, to any mortal smile. You purify the air of eternity here where I breathe the air of my fathers. So I think I got my color coding right here. So let's have a quick look at some of the attitude words that hopefully are in blue. Yes, I did get them right. So we've got all, which is not pronounced awe. It's awe. It is solemn wonder. So if you are in awe of something, you think it is amazing. You almost all suggest that you almost can't speak. It is so amazing. And the word solemn is something is very serious. So you have the serious sense of wonder when looking at something. It's awe inspiring. Okay. So we've got one tone attitude there. That's our awe. Let's go look for our other blue ones reverent he has a reverent attitude and that's treating a subject with honor and respect and i think i only did two blue ones because respectful is another attitude or he has an attitude of respect so we actually have three um tone words there let me oh no look at me i did i did do another third one solemn he's got a solemn attitude um deeply earnest which is very serious and he tends towards sad reflection so there's a third one that we well there's actually four that we can add so we've got solemn just leave that up for a sec so that you can copy as much of it as quickly as you quickly can. The ones in blue, don't copy anything else. Reverend, treating a subject with honor and respect. And solemn, deeply earnest, which means serious, tending towards sad reflection. Okay. So let's go back to our question here. 
the speaker's attitude is reverent and sullen. There we go. We've got our mark for the attitude, our one word emotion that tells us how the speaker feels. But we've given two because we are extra. I can see this because he acknowledges. I don't know why I must think. I can see this because the speaker acknowledges. And now I can't see my line, and I need to see my line when I'm writing my answer. Um, that the spirits guard and protect. So I'm not just using the word from the from the poem. I'm showing that I understand this and protect the space he is in, and they keep it pure. Okay, that that notion of purity. And what I've done here by adding in the pure, the purity, is I've also just made sure I've referred to both lines. So here they're guarding it, they're protecting it, and here they're purifying it. And so that suggests that he's reverent. The speaker's attitude is reverent, respectful, solemn. Uh, he feels, you could even say he feels a sense of awe for the spirits or the ancestors. Okay, so that's that one. Now we've got our 4.3. And I've highlighted, referred to lines 9 and 10, um, because this was a specific quote. It came from lines 9 and 10, but it wasn't the entirety of lines 9 and 10. So lines, it was here, it was, listen to me now while the Africa of despotism is dying. So it did not include this agony of a pitiful princess. So I must stick to this image, the image that's highlighted. I mustn't go beyond that. So the image of the Africa of despotism dying shows that the cruel and tyrannical powers controlling Africa are coming to an end. Okay, so I've explained my image. In the context of the poem, where the speaker asks the spirits to help overthrow the colonial powers at work in Africa, because that's what the, the context of my poem is. The image suggests that, excuse me, the image suggests that, so I'm going to go back, okay, Listen to me now while the Africa of despotism is dying. Okay, I'm just going to go back to that. The image suggests that this is the best time now to help the speaker because it will be the most beneficial as there is already change occurring. There is the, the despots are already starting to die, okay? So the now while the Africa of despotism is dying, listen to me. He's saying the time is opportune. This is the best time to do it now. Let's strike in essence, while the iron is hot. So that's the effect of this image. Listen to me now while the Africa of despotism is dying. Okay. Then the 4.4, .4, that's where I want to go back up and just look at this question type. We're going to look at line 21 in a sec. Critically discuss how this line conveys the central message of the poem. So let's just go up first. And we're going to look here at, eventually, when I finish scrolling up, this is a similar question type, okay? But I changed it a little because I wanted to add in um, this section here. 
I wanted to add in diction, okay? Because we don't have any diction questions in this particular paper, and diction often comes up. So before I tell you how to answer this question, a reminder, diction is word choice, okay? Words have got specific connotations, specific ideas associated with them. And when we're looking at diction, we are going to do the following. So I'm going to give you two question types in one on this one. The first one is the diction. The first one, is, the next one that we'll do is that critically comment on the line. So let's look at the diction first. Diction is word choice and connotation. With a diction question, Whatever type of diction question you get, whether it's paper one, paper two, doesn't matter where you see it, with a diction question, I must quote specific words. And I want to highlight this specific, okay? You cannot quote an entire sentence and expect to get a diction mark because that is not word choice. Then you're just quoting words. You need to look at specific words. So you can quote one or two words at a time. If you feel the need to quote an entire sentence because it just works with how you're trying to phrase your argument, then you have to underline or highlight one or two words within that sentence. But if you're not doing that, then you are not going to get that initial diction mark. Okay, so with a diction question, um, you must quote specific words and unpack the connotations of those words. Okay, so there's two marks or a mark for that. In this question, you'd actually get one mark for quoting the word and unpacking the connotation. Okay, so here I'm going to quote my word. I'm going to unpack the connotation. There's one mark. Then I need to discuss the central message. The central message is the lesson. And it's sort of like the global lesson that the um, speaker wants us to learn. And my critical comment, sorry, I'm going to have a look at the, the chat in a sec. I'm just going to finish this one. My critical comment. Sorry, Roberta. Yeah. I think something is happening. Your screen is not sharing. Oh, Are is we this seeing what's going you? On? It just <laughs> happens now, I think. Okay. Let me hit share. Maybe I've pushed something. Thanks, guys. Sorry. Yes. I was just trying yes. to finish what I was doing, and obviously you couldn't see anything. Uh, um, I should no. be there. How's that? It was just now for the, for the last two or three minutes, Roberta. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Um, so I'm assuming you can see now. I hope you can see now. Yes. Okay. Let me just go back there. The central message is the global lesson that the speaker wants, to, wants us to learn, so I need to date what that central message is and a critical comment when I critically comment okay when I critically comment I must explain how I feel about something in essence it's my evaluation or judgment on something in this case it's my judgment on the lesson. It's my judgment on the, the diction chosen on that lesson. It's easier to do when we get there. Okay, so I'll show you when we get there. But if I've got, which we do have in our questions, we've had a critically comment on how the lines reinforce the central message of the poem. If it's the lines, then I can look at diction. Okay. I can look at image. I can even look at tone or attitude because all of those things are within the line. I just need to make sure that as with diction, I'm quoting or referring clearly to specific parts of the line and I'm unpacking and I'm explaining it. So it's very, very similar, okay? 
um, I'm doing something very, very similar. But if they're asking for diction, it's specific words that must be quoted and unpacked. If it's the lines, I can do diction, I can do image, I can do tone and attitude. Um, I could even bring a bit of structure or rhyme into it, depending on what's going on in the line. So let's go back quickly. I think we're going to have time for one poem, but I did give a second poem. And that second poem uh, does have the memo as well. Okay, so. Line 21, but we are the men of the dance whose feet only gain power when they beat the hard soil. So I need to give some unpacking of those lines, okay? So here we go. But we are the men of the dance whose feet only gain power when they beat the hard, hard soil. So I'm going to start with the word. Fact shows us that the speaker does not believe that African men, African people, that African people are um, men of death. Men of death. Instead, he sees them as being full of life and vitality and competence, competence with their ability to dance, okay? Um, the dance also represents a connection to the African culture and its power. Okay. This conveys the central message that, or critically discussed, this conveys the central message that. Um, so our central message is the people of Africa have the power and potential to overthrow colonialism. And now I'm going to add in that critical, critical discussion, that critical comment that gives my sort of perspective what I think of this. I think this image is very appropriate because the speaker uses an image of dance which conveys um the, the joy of African culture and how it can help to bring an end to the suffering caused by I'm thinking here about the machines and the wars. So I'm thinking here about these lines in particular, uh, machines and cannons, okay, and how the dance is a counterpoint to that. I think this is this image is very appropriate because because you know, um, caused by industrialization and by war. Okay, so there we go. I've got that. We have. 10 minutes for our poetry essay, which is a pity, um, because poetry essays are a place where you can score pretty well. Um, let me have a quick scoot through this. Um, as with the literature essay, you must pay attention to the question requirements. So you can't just write whatever you want about your poem. You have to stick, in this case, to the legacy and impact people, people fighting apartheid had. So here we've got our question. The poem, The Child Who Was Shot Dead, highlights the legacy and impact made by people protesting oppressive governments. So I must, in any image that I look at, I must give that, the legacy and impact made by people protesting oppressive government regimes, okay? 
I need to reference tone, diction, and imagery in doing that. So I'm going to take you through a structure, which is a great structure to use for a poetry essay in a second, but I do want to bring your attention to something. In the rubric for your poetry essay, unlike your literary essay, okay, unlike your essay on the novel or the drama, you don't get marks for an introduction or a conclusion. There's nothing here under structure. It says coherent structure, arguments well structured, language good, impressive, virtually error free. That doesn't mean you don't have an introduction and a conclusion. It does mean that you don't have to do a full takeo, like a title, author, keywords, outline. And it does mean that you don't have to go into a full um, conclusion where you're linking back to all of the critical points that you made in your essay. So you're keeping your introduction and your conclusion super short. You're also not doing a complete peel method essay here. What you are using to structure your essay instead is you're going to focus one paragraph on Diction, one paragraph on imagery, and your conclusion is going to be focused on tone. You're going to wrap up with your tone. You will find, um, depending on the poem, and this is the case in the second poem that I gave you, that diction and imagery overlap. And that's fine. Sometimes you're not going to be able to separate them completely. But what you do, like you do in your contextuals, is you use your wording to help show your marker what you're actually looking at. So let's have a quick look here. This is my introduction, okay? Through diction, imagery, and tone, Yonker shows that, do you know what I'm going to do, guys? Because we we're pushed for time, I'm actually going to pull up the memo, if you don't mind, because that's going to be quicker than if I try and type right now. Okay, so I'm going to go back up here. And I'm going to highlight specific aspects of the memo. I'm not going to look at the entire thing. So through, you might start your, your introduction by saying, through diction, imagery, and tone, Yonker highlights the legacy and impact that people who have protested against oppressive regimes have made. So every image that I look at, I'm looking at legacy and impact. So I'm going to pick specific images and I'm going to pick specific diction that to my mind speak a little bit more to that. Okay. So the legacy and impact here, I'm going to say that peeps through the houses, this one here, this is an image. And if we look back at the sheet that I gave you, um, you'll see that with the images I, I've used here, I've said the image of, and I've quoted it, shows the, the child who became a man. I can say the metaphor of a child who became a man and tracked through all of Africa, or I can say comparing the man to a giant. So I'm showing in my language while I quote the specific images that I'm talking about imagery. Okay, I'm not just jumping in and talking about whatever, I'm talking about imagery. So the image peeps through windows of houses and into the hearts of mothers conveys how surveillance is intrusive and the emotional toll of living under constant threat. But I'm going to link that back a little bit more to this legacy and impact. Okay, I'm going to say it's the child who's peeping through the windows of houses and into the hearts of mothers. This shows us that the child has impacted mothers, not just in the townships, but all over, in all windows of all houses. They think about children who have lost their lives to the apartheid regime. So there's my impact that this child has had. Then I'm going to look at the image became a man and treks through all of Africa. This image suggests a journey of self-discovery and empowerment. So here is legacy and impact, symbolizing the transformation of the child into a symbol of resistance and solidarity across the continent. That's the impact that they've made. This shows that this the impact of people who fought against apartheid 
is not just limited to South Africa, but impacted the rest of the world, um, became a giant, travels through the world. The image of the child becoming a giant suggests how powerful the child has become. And traveling the whole world suggests the freedom that these children have fought for, the freedom that these children have died for is now open to everyone within South Africa. So in this, I'm focusing on legacy and impact. When it comes to diction, I'm using specific words that look at legacy and impact. So I would say the diction, the child is not dead, challenges the idea of real physical death, suggesting the enduring presence and influence of the child's spirit and resistance. So this is the impact. The child has not died. Their impact continues even after death. I would look at armed pride, and I'd say this phrase suggests a sense of empowerment and defiance, highlighting the de determination of the oppressed to resist tyranny and assert their dignity. So here we've got again that impact they were able with the armed pride to fight against tyranny. Lies with a bullet in his head. It reminds us that these children actually did die, but that they were able to overcome their real death or their physical death, um, or the people were able to overcome their physical death because it became a symbol a symbolic fight against that death. The, the child did not die symbolically because the child, the idea of the child, the spirit of the child was able to live on and fight against apartheid. So then very quickly, the tone of the poem is one of defiance, resilience, and solidarity. This is how you would wrap it up. While it mourns the loss of innocent life, and exposes the brutality of state violence, it also celebrates the spirit of resistance and the collective struggle for liberation. That over there is enough for a conclusion. You've told what the tone is, it's mournful as well, but you've also said it's celebrating that people are able to overcome these terrible scenarios. So that puts us at 12.14, um, which is um, a few seconds away from finishing. <laughs> um, and there is on that sheet, there's another example. What I would advise you to do in your prep is that you go through, highlight three examples of diction, three examples of image, look at the structure, and then go and look at the memo and see how on track you are. That's me, ma'am. I am done. Ooh.